Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Romans chapter 5 and verses 20. Romans chapter 5 and verses 20. And let us all read. One, two, three, let's go. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Somebody shout hallelujah. Say amen. Say amen. Now the Bible says that moreover the law entered that the offense might abound. In other words, where the law is, offense abounds. I don't know whether when people read the Bible, they actually read these things. But the Bible says, where the law is, offense abounds. So the Bible says that the law entered that offense might what? Might abound. But where sin abounded, the Bible says, grace did much more abound. Somebody shout, hallelujah. Now, if there's anything that I believe even Satan has failed to understand. Of course, the people of this world cannot understand. People who are not born again cannot understand. The religions of this world cannot understand. In fact, it's worse for certain. It's something that the world has failed to understand. The thing that separates your faith, what you believe, and any other faith in the world is defined in statements like these. When the Bible says that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Think about it. The more sin increased, the more grace God increased. Where do you find that? Except in the Christian faith. Where would you find that? Where would you find a place where God would continue giving grace even where sin is abounding? Except here. This is a thing that even the people who hear this, what they call the grace message, have failed to understand. That's why many people have failed to understand the message of grace. Because every time you're talking about it, it is so hard for the human mind in the carnal nature it is word to understand that where sin abounded, grace much more did abound. In other words, wherever God saw sin, he added more grace. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. Now the Bible says in First John chapter 4 verses 10, he says here in his word, Love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. He says here in his love, the world has its definition of love. I love you because you love me. I love you because you're good. First John 4.10 says here in his word, love, that not that we loved God, but the Bible says, but that he loved us and he sent his only son to be the propitiation of our sins. Not that we loved him. It's not love because we were loving to him. It is love because even before we loved him, the Bible says he loved us. Now that is love. Hallelujah. He first loved you and I before you even thought to love him. Even if you don't love him, he still loves you. 
Somebody shout amen. His love toward you is unconditional. It is eternal. It is reliable. It is trustworthy. It is steadfast. It is immovable. Somebody shout amen. Here in his love he has said, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. For the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ what? Died. While we were yet sinners. Which faith teaches this? Which religion teaches that? Which sect teaches this except the Christian faith? Hallelujah. And how be it that the Christians have failed to understand how deep this is? How is that Christians have failed to understand the power of this? In fact, when you think about it from the human perspective, why would God increase grace where sin is? I thought the obvious thing would be that as sin increased, judgment did. Hallelujah. But where God was supposed to put judgment, the Bible says he put grace. The Bible says in the 22nd verse of Isaiah 42, he was talking about Israel. He was giving a picture about Israel. He gave us a certain state about Israel. As I'm reading, I want your mind to go there. I want you to imagine, as God is saying these things, in your mind, create the picture of what you think he's implying when he's defining the state of Israel. He says in verses 22, he says, but this is a people robbed and what? Spoiled. The Bible says they are all of them snared in holes and they are hid in prison houses. The Bible says they are for prey and none delivereth for a spoil and none saith restore. In other words, they are in a state of too much bondage that no one even among them feels the conviction to come out. That's how bad Israel had fallen. Somebody said, Amen. He asked in 23, who among you will give ear to this? Who will hearken to hear for the time to come? Who gave Jacob for a spoil and Israel to the robbers? Did not the Lord, he against whom we have sinned? For they would not walk in his ways, neither were they obedient unto his law. Therefore the Bible says he has poured upon him the fury of his anger and the strength of battle, and it has set him on fire round about, yet he knew not, and it burned him, yet he laid it not at heart. As in Israel got so opposed from God, it got so indifferent from God, that even when judgment came, Israel did not put its heart to it. That is why I tell people, no degree of human punishment can change the human heart. It's not there. The more God afflicted Israel, the more Israel rebelled. I always tell you people that. I always say that the more God hit them, the more they became more rebellious. Because it's not in human nature to respond to anything that is not love. Somebody shout hallelujah. So the Bible says he poured upon him, that is uh, Israel, the fury of his hand and the strength of battle, and it has set him on fire round about. And the Bible says, and he didn't, doesn't know. It's not that things are not set against Israel. It's almost as though Israel got to a point where even if things are set against him, he doesn't care. Their ears blocked. Their eyes blocked. Their eyes ceased to see. They disconnected from God. They rebelled themselves and set themselves off course. If you read the whole chapter of 42, you'll understand what I mean. And in all of this, God feels that he needs to redeem them, but he has to begin from somewhere. Somebody shout, Amen. Now, in the 43rd chapter, verses 1, he says, But now, thus saith the Lord, but now, this is in spite of all that Israel has gone through, all that Israel has set itself against, all that Israel has made up in mind to rebel against God. He says, but now that says the Lord. Now this is God speaking to a rebellious people. 
He knows they are dealing with issues. Hallelujah. He knows they are dealing with what? With issues. And he says, but now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, he told them, fear not. If you read the 42nd chapter, and then you see the tone of heart in the 43rd, you ask yourself, what is God thinking? I thought he's angry with them. I thought they've gone off the course. I thought they're indifferent and ignorant. I thought that their ears are closed from God and their eyes do not see as they ought. I thought they've rebelled themselves against the cause. But then you still see that he's expressing a certain heart and attitude toward the same people. And he says, but now that said the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel. He told them, fear not. He says, for I have what? Redeemed thee. And he says, and I have called thee by thy name. And he tells them that in spite of your stupidity, he tells them that you are still mine. He tells them in spite of their funny life, he says, you are still mine. He still owns them, even in their own indifference. He still says, yes, I know you have your issues, but you are still mine. Somebody shout hallelujah. I know you sometimes do things that, eh? but, he says, I have redeemed you. And he says, and you are still mine. Verses 2, he says, when thou passest through the water, he says, in spite of your stupidness, I will be with you. Somebody said hallelujah. And he says, and through the rivers, he says, they shall not overflow thee. He says, when thou walkest through the fire, he says, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee, even though you have issues. Yeah, I know you've messed up, but when you go in fire, I go with you. Yeah, I know you have your issues, yes, but when you're thrown in the waters, you don't sink alone. God is not the God who says, uh-uh, you're too much. Sink. Burn and see. No. In spite of Israel's ignorance, in spite of Israel's rebellion, in spite of what Israel did, are you hearing me? When Israel fell in the rain, when Israel fell in the fire, God said, ah, I know you have issues, I know you landed yourself here, but because you're there and you're mine, let's go. Let's go, hallelujah. Let's go. Ask your neighbor, where would you find that? Except in Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thanks be to God who never left you. Thanks be to God who never deserted you. Thanks be to God who never gave up on you. Somebody shout hallelujah. That is Jehovah God. Where would you find that kind of love? Only in Jesus. He said, go through the fire. Some people think that that scripture is for righteous people who have only done good things. No. Understand this. Isaiah 43 is not for people who have only done the right stuff. This was Israel chapter 42. And he defined the state of Israel in chapter 42. So that when we enter 43, you understand, I'm not just dealing with people who are doing only the right things. People who have only been right before me. Even the funniest folk, he says, no. You might be in fire because it's not your fault, I'll be there. But if you still land yourself in fire and it's your fault, I'll still be there. Because you are mine. You don't need to believe me. Read the scriptures. Somebody said hallelujah. And he continues to say, And when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither, he says, shall the flame kindle upon you. Somebody said hallelujah. He says, you will not be burned, but even smoke will not touch you. 
People won't smell you and say, have you been in fire? That's what I'm trying to say. He's not the God who wants to take you out. But he's the God who wants to take you out with the effects of that thing out. So that when you stand, people will never look at you and say you're limping because you are in something. He wants to take away the issue with a limp. He wants to take away the attack with a consequence. He wants to take the disease with its sign. Somebody shout, Amen! Ask your neighbor, where would you find that? Sareketere bakatalapa. Rosa la baraka sorobu. Zireketere payara bakatalapa. Zeri reko. Saints. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. But I thought, God, you're supposed to let her go through the fire. So she learned. And God says, uh -uh, she didn't learn by fire. She learns by love. Slap somebody. He does not learn by being drowned in water. He learns by being loved in the water. Are you hearing me? First Corinthians 13 verses 8. Love never... Somebody said amen. But prophecies fail. Revelations fail. Tongues cease. But he says, but this agape. I thought she needs to go through a prison for like 10 years. So she can learn her lessons. He says, if you take her to prison, I will go with her. If you arrest her, I will go with her in prison. If you incarcerate him, I will go where he is. If you throw him on an island, I will give him revelation. Somebody shout, Amen. Because that is the love of God. He is with you in the worst time possible. That's why if you're here and you're going through a hard time, uh -huh. he's there. He's there. He is there. He is with you. 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 I said he's with you. He's with you. He has never left you. He said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. That was not a condition. That was a sovereign promise based on his nature, not on your character. Did you understand what I just said? He didn't say, if you do this, I'll get out. No. He said, I will never leave you, ne forsake you. I will never leave you. These are the things he says that give us contentment. He is still with you. Then you first believe. But Satan has convinced believers that when things are out of the way, God has departed. When you look for rent and you fail to pay, God has departed. Because she left you, God has departed of me. Because you lost this, oh, the glory of God has departed of me. Because you lost the job, oh, the, the glory of God has departed of me. He said, when you go through fire, I will be with you. And I will make sure you don't get burned. My God. My God. I will make sure you will not even smell the soot. Somebody shout amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. And then he continues to say, in verses 3, he says, For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of what? Of Israel, thy what? Thy Savior. And he says, I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. I got nations and I looked at them. And I looked at you. And they set themselves against you. 
and I said I will clear you for that fellow. He's trying to tell you, I've not given up jobs for you. I've given up nations for you. That is how much I love you. It means that if you got a hundred million people that are set against God and you're here, he picks you. He would lose them to keep you. Now, he said, I gave up. You just didn't know that I did, but I did. Some of you, it's because you were never told. But God has given up too much for you. I say God has given up too much for you. Somebody sent me a message a couple of days ago and said, I don't think I have a reason for living. I'm going to commit suicide. I just replied to them and I told them, you don't know who you are. Die. I told them, die. You don't know who you are. God has given lives for you. I don't care what you're going through. God has given nations for you. There are people who died for you. What a love. He continues to say, Since thou was precious in my sight, he says, Thou has been honorable because you are precious. I gave you honor. You're not honorable because of what you've done. You're honorable because in my sight you're precious. And he says, Since thou was precious in my sight, Thou hast been honorable. He says, and I have loved thee. Therefore, I didn't do it only, but even now, I will give men for you and people for your life any day. He said, I will give men for thee and people for your life. The night is danger is coming. God says, I will serve my faith. You understand? He said, I will give people for your life. If Satan wants to sacrifice, let him sacrifice others. Not your child. If he seeks to kill, let him kill others. Not you. How can you give up? When God is ready to kill a man for you. Not directly translated. <laughs> Somebody peace on yourself and say, ah, fearfully and wonderfully met. Sarabakatarabakayi. Zeri repaya. He says, verse 5, fear not, again he has said it, that regardless of what you're going through, I'm with thee. He says, I will bring thy seed, I will bring thy seed from the east, and I will gather thee from the west, and I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. And what does the seventh verse say? He says, even everyone that is called by my name, he says, for I have created whoever has been called by my name, him for my work, for my glory, and I have formed him. I'm the one who made him. That means if you're here and you're born again, God looks at glory. And began making you. He looked at you as a piece. And then looked at glory. And said, hmm. Then he adds.
you walk in glory you sleep in glory you live in glory you speak in glory you act in glory you set in glory you work in glory you labor in glory you study in glory you speak in glory you see in glory you meditate in glory you dream in glory everything about you was made for the glory of god but man of god the things have gone through he knew you could handle he knew you can handle listen when the bible says no temptation that has befallen you it's not common it means the thing that is disturbing you has ever attacked a certain person but the bible says but god will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able do you know what it means but why is it that it's me going through these things because you're the one who can handle if it hits another man he will die that is why paul says i glory in my infirmity somebody can laugh at what you're going through but they don't know that you're going to go through somebody said amen god cannot test you above that which you are able i don't care what report is on your life that one you can handle you can handle i said you can handle so if you're there and you've never gone through hard times don't think you're better No. Maybe for you if some things come you die. That is why when Paul looks inside him he says for when I am weak. He says that wherever he sees weakness he sees strength. Because he figures Satan cannot put weakness where he has not seen strength. That is not the devil. He doesn't think like that. He's too dense. Do you understand what I'm saying? Why do they abduct children in homes? Why not street children? Have you ever heard of a street child sacrificed? No. They go for those ones in homes. He cannot attack what doesn't have something. Somebody met me sometime and said, Man of God, how do you feel? And the person was speaking to me. And I said, how do you feel when people accuse you and they say, the cult, the devil worshiper. How do you feel? No, no, listen. I told him, look. You're seeing it from the victim side. Come to the glorious lane and understand. Listen, listen. I told him, look. I'm not the devil. And he knows it. I cast out devils. And he knows it. I cleanse leopards. And he knows it. But by the time I do all of that, and he still wants to say, I am his, then I am too, too, too deep. <laughs> Did you understand what I just said? By the time I put damage on him, and he still says, he's mine, you understand? Eh? Then what is on me? Did you understand what I just said? If I can do all of the damage, if I win souls from every Thursday, I win souls every Sunday, I win souls, I'm casting out devils, I'm depopulating hell, and the guy can still want to own me. That tells you my value. <laughs> I say that tells you my what? My value. I'm too valuable. But even if I damage him, he still wants to own me. So I told the believer, those things don't faze me. They encourage me more to preach the gospel. So never worry if they say, oh, you are this thing, you go under what here. You let them say. You understand? If you are poor, they would not say it. <laughs> if you did not have results, they would not say it. If things were not happening for you, they would not say it. 
and that is my prayer that may results continue flourishing on your life that men will call you names because they'll look for a name to call you and they don't have it in the mighty name of Jesus I was created for the glory of God and I'm just beginning this is just a beginning I'm going far glory to God Glory to God. They will call you which doctors at your workplaces. Clap your hands when they do. Hallelujah. Don't lose appetite over that. You know who you are. You know what is inside you. Why did you expect them to call you? Humble Christian? Predictable woman? No. The scriptures already said you are strange people. So, if the world tries to construct your strengthness into an idea of a name and a title, it is good because it means now they have realized that you're an uncommon person. Somebody shout amen. Shout amen. The favor of men by men is different from the favor of men by God. Did you understand what I just said? The favor of men by men is different from the favor of God by men. There's a difference. When men favor you with the favor of men, they can only extend the hand of survival on you and put a predictable sort on your life. But regardless of the successes of your life, they are only in the spaces of prediction because they are handing down to you, not upward to you. There's a person who says, oh, I am favored. They paid my rent for me. On the same earth, there is a man who is so favored that he's paying rent for people. I am favored that they bought this for me. On the same earth, there is a man who is favored enough that is the one buying for. Ask your neighbor where you want to be. It is more blessed to what? Than to what? Than to receive. When Joseph was young, the favor of God settled on him. The father did not know what to call it. All he knew, he loved this boy. But what was on that man's life was called the favor of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? It was called the favor of what? Of God. And the Bible tells us that he loved this boy so much. And you can even judge the man and say, but... It's all these are your children. Why would you love this fellow more than the other? In principle, he could not help to love the boy. Because what was inviting him on that boy was not the boy's looks. Surely, his sons were good looking. But there was something on Joseph that every time he looked at him, he loved him. It's called the favor of God. Are you hearing me? It took him so long to understand that this thing inside him was inviting him to the destiny of his son. And what that was for Israel. He never knew. Jacob never knew. He took so long to know. But the same man favoring his boy, at one particular point when the boy starts to dream, I saw a star and the moon, the stars bowing. He says, hey, yeah, yeah, I love you, but. Are you telling me that your mother and I and your brothers are going to bow down to you? Hey, don't talk about it. 
Because much as the favor on your life is inviting me, you're speaking things bigger than you. You're speaking things that don't make sense to me. God never told me anything about that. Much as the favor of God is upon you, we can't connect with the dreams God has placed inside you. Somebody said amen. And then, the favor of God in the Father is the thing that buys that coat. Because God knows to take this guy to Egypt, I need a coat with colors. That's all I need. Man, some of you, the things you're weeping in, they're literally taking you where you must go. But you call it the spirit of rejection. God knew that to get this man out of Israel and put him in Egypt, he just needed a coat. He just needed a coat. He just needed a coat. Buy him a coat. <laughs> it is enough to move any of the brothers into anger and envy and rage. Yet the court was not the sign of the favor. No. The court was simply an element in the story to throw the man where he belonged. Tell your neighbor, learn to define what true favor is and the elements that take you there. Because some of you have dwelt in the elements and you call them the end of your favor. The dwelling of your favor. No, the court was an element. He was never going to put it on forever. Are you hearing me? They even conspired to kill. Some of you must understand. When you say, I am favored of God, what it means. A man's own flesh and blood wanted to kill him. Because of what was upon him. So when you say that the favor of God is upon you, there are people who will hate you by default. Those ones you don't need to do good. And neither do you need to do bad. You're favored. If you don't want them to hate you, release yourself of that favor. They'll bypass you on the street and even favor you with a coin. They'll even find you and feel sorry for you and they say, Bambi, poor man, and then they give you bread. Hallelujah. Somebody shout amen. And now we see this fellow. He's leaving places. He gets into a household. Favor follows him. Are you hearing me? And then some kind of funny woman stages a story. Are you hearing me? But there's something looking for the favored man. It thinks that it's destroying the destiny. Do you know? When Joseph was in prison, Satan thought he had tainted the man's destiny. Do you know that when Joseph was in prison, Satan thought it was the end of Joseph? Do you know that when Joseph was in prison, Satan knew in his head that I've put enough mark on him to forever put mischief on his life, reproach. That wherever he or she will go, they'll say, that is the one who. And one time when I was reading that scripture, I cut a wire. I asked God, God, at least when he became governor, you would have tried to bring Potiphar's wife to the court. Such that at the end of the end, everybody say, ah, you see? Potiphar's wife was lying. But that woman died without a trial. And there are people who died. And they are sure that guy, <laughs> he had his problems. So one time I said, God, why wouldn't you vindicate your servant? And God told me this. He said, when I put favor on you, I can only vindicate you before those who you will need or with whom your destiny has a connection to. 
it is irrelevant for God to waste time for the whole world to know you're innocent. And if you're that kind who wants everyone to know, you're in the wrong ministry. You're in the wrong faith. Some will die without ever knowing the truth. It is because they don't have any connection to your destiny. And to God it doesn't matter whether they think you are or not. And you have to get to that level where it doesn't matter whether some people know the truth or they don't. That's called freedom in Christ. <laughs> Slap somebody and tell them I'm free. Some of you, you want everyone to know that you're not the one who stole the work. Hey, they are lying. I'm going to expose you. And then you say, hey, you see, this damn expires on the 2nd January. Eh? Now you say, but may I edit on the 4th? Can I eat expired jam? Uh-uh. That is why I tell men of God, never find yourself explaining. Never fall in the trap of explaining yourself when you know God a certain way. Unless when you're just a survivor. But if you have seen God, why? Because Pharaoh will dream something only the rapist can interpret. I said Pharaoh will dream something only the rapist can interpret. Did you understand what I just said? And that is how God makes you relevant. He creates a problem. But only you, only you. Somebody said, God, co create problems. Say it, say it. Create problems I only can solve. Shataraba. I don't care whether you're a doctor or an engineer, an IT pastor, I don't care where you are. But may God cause a need that only you can solve. Somebody shout amen. Say glory to God. And what seemed like imprisonment was simply the man of oil waiting for his destiny, for the opportunity. And many people never understood it. Many never understood it. Now imagine Joseph is in prison. Like somebody here might be in some sort of prison. And then he starts, why me? Lord, why me? Why am I the one going through this? Why am I the one in prison? If you are God, how could you let her? If you are God, why would you let him? And also there's also another school of thought saying, if it was God, he would have vindicated you. Why are you in prison? Because they don't know the end. They don't know the what? They don't know the end. Hallelujah. Somebody shout amen. Say glory to God. But the Bible says that even with Potiphar, he still saw that thing. He didn't have a name for it. But he saw it. And the Bible says he severed Joseph. And his household also prospered. So he didn't even know how to handle the casting on the boy. He goes in prison. The thing follows him. He's put in charge of all the fellow prisoners. The prison guards, they don't know what's on the guy. But they just find that he's being thrown in certain places. Even though he's a rapist. In quotes, do you understand what I'm saying? And an opportunity comes where this thing manifests. And in manifestation, God simply brings out, and you know, every time I think that Pharaoh with all his magicians could not interpret his dream, 
It was not because they could not guess. It was because God even denied any sorcerer to guess. I mean, they would deceive him. But even a devil worshiper would go to hell and come back and say, this one has no answer. <laughs> Did you understand what I said? That is what they call the favor of God. What he has placed on you, no man can interpret. What God has put on you, no man can what? And where ministers or people believe as Christians miss it, is those good days when things are not going right. Is those good days when things seem to go off. And some people lose the plot. They lose the vision. They lose the understanding. They lose God's mind and purpose concerning their lives. They look at the things that are seen, which are temporal. How are you hearing me? There was a time when we were younger in the gospel. Certain things used to scare us. But as you grow, you start to realize the things that used to scare me actually could not destroy me. I'm still here. Some of you, if you are to count how many things you have overcome, even to be seated here this evening, if somebody hears it, they can become born again again. They can just say, you know, let me receive. Do I have a witness? Do I have people here? Now, if you start telling your story, one time a guy came in my office and told me, Apostle, leave me. Me, leave me. Now, you can imagine a man tells you, I says, Apostle, if I tell you my story, just leave me. I said, ah, ah, don't scare me. He says, I leave me. I said, don't scare me. The man started narrating. He narrated. After hearing his story, I told him, you know what, let's kneel and pray. I had things. And I said, if this cup is alive, but now the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This thing we preach is real. It is real. Somebody shout hallelujah. Tell your neighbor you will make it. Whether the devil wants it or not. Why? Because you are favored of God. You are created for his glory. That's why I tell people. Take heed when men favor you as men. And when God favors you through men, that one is different. Because with that one, when God favors you through a man, that man has no choice. Even if he's set against you, he will still bless you. That's called the favor of God. And that is why I decree, let 2020 be a year where you will reap even from the people that you know hate you most if you believe each other amen where you will be blessed even by men who don't agree with you where men will add to you even where you didn't expect because they don't even fit in the picture of men who could probably have added on you in fact the name joseph means god has added God has increased. God has multiplied. Somebody shout hallelujah. I want to speak upon your life that you're entering a season of favor. Not because favor has fallen on you. No, the favor of God is on you. I just said you're entering a season of favor. As a favored man. And mark the windows that are going to throw you to places your education can't throw you. Your finances can't throw you. The connections you have right now can't throw you. I see that God is weaving another set of connections for you. Come on, open your mouth and pray. Speak to God. Speak to God. 
speak to God. God is with you. Rano robo sere bakataraba. I will exalt you. Come on, speak in other tongue. I will exalt you. I will exalt you. You are my God. Come on. I will exalt you. Rosara Rabakatara. I will exalt you. I will exalt you. You were my God. My hiding place, my sacred refuge, my shelter, Lord. You are my friend, my king, anointed one, most holy, my hiding place, my sacred you. My treasure, Lord, you were, you're my friend, the anointed one, most holy, my hiding place, my faith. My treasure, Lord, you are my friend, I'm not friend, but Tell 
Father, because you're with me. Tell it because you're with me. I will not be. God. And these are the things I intend to speak for as long as I'm alive. Because these are the things he anointed me for. To star the greatness in men. To call out that thing in you. To remind it that you're going somewhere. Regardless of what you've gone through. God abide faithful. You might have made mistakes in the past. That is why he sent his grace. To say, yes, I know you, Aaron. But there is still a chance for you. There is still another opportunity to correct it. I still have plans for you. To make you prosper, not to harm you. To give you that future, that hope, and that expected end. I love you unconditionally. Hey, hallelujah. See, there are people here who some had gotten to the point of accepting it. 
and they got in the place of saying, maybe God, this is how far. Maybe this is it. I just need to learn to work with what's here. Listen to God. This is not your end. You might have been slowed, but this is not your end. You might have had a setback, but this is not the end of your story. Do not get comfortable with where you are. Do not create survival instincts and pitching tents where you are. Pitch tents where you're going. Lift your eyes and see. The Bible says he's set in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. For he does trust in you. He's trusted in you. And the what therefore mind is imagination. He says he stayed in perfect peace whose imagination is stayed on you. Imagine God. I said imagine God. Read everything in scripture and imagine it for you. See yourself enter those roads. Walk into those buildings. Walk on those streets. Walk into that destiny. Walk into that marriage. Carry that child in the name of Jesus. Stand on that altar. Preach on that stadium. Hey! Your mind stays on God. He says, for I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to make you prosper and not to harm you. To give you that future, that hope, that expected end. He says, whatsoever things are good, imagine. Whatsoever things are lovely, imagine. Whatsoever things are honest, Imagine, whatsoever things are just, imagine, whatsoever things are of good report, imagine, if there be any virtue, imagine, if there be any praise, imagine, he says, think on this thing, I say think on this thing, dream, see those things. See yourself enter doors that no man can open except God. See yourself enter doors. See yourself enter opportunities. See yourself standing on pedestals, on platforms. See yourself being invited on tables only God can ordain you for. Hey! I sense in my spirit that some of you are going to receive calls, letters, proposals, consultations. Inquiry, not so from now, the favor of God can change your life for good. I say the favor of God can change your life for good. I say the favor of God can change your life for good. Somebody just stepped into something. I see it. Somebody just stepped into something. Somebody just stepped into something. I feel it. I feel it. Fire! Hey! 
Somebody receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. I feel 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 it. an anointing that moves things. And that's why I decree as a man of God that whatever looks back, God is moving it. God is moving it. God is moving it. I want you to clap like walls are broken. Celebrate God. Celebrate God. Like a wall has been broken. Celebrate God. Praise God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Sarah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. There was a glory as ago that I used to feel in the inside. And I used to feel it for many years. Many years. Many years. There was an anointing in my life for so many years I used to feel. And I used to even dream it. And for so many years, I used to ask God, when will I see this thing? When will I see this thing? And one day when I was reading the Word, something fell on me. I remember the day it did. And the Lord said, from today, Your physical life has changed. When I looked around me, there was nothing physical. But I can count those years and see. Now I see. There were many years of inquiry. But the day it sat, I knew it. I knew it, but it had sat. And that's the confidence I have. That something has settled on a certain person on this ground. In a few weeks. In a few days. You're going to look back from this day. And admit something settled on me I know it that's the confidence I have that something has been moved on some family something has been removed reproach has been taken off a woman tonight watch the favor of God brighten your future Watch it beautify your destiny. Somebody say amen. If you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, the Bible says they cannot hear except they are given a preacher. I have preached 
And so if you're there and you feel God has spoken to your heart tonight. Repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, tonight I have heard the gospel. I believe in my heart that you died and rose again for my sins. I receive you tonight as my Lord and Savior. I'm born again. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at sonerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.sonero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make Manson.